this is a test. Good morning. Good morning. We passed. All right. I just want to be sure we're all awake as we start out here. If some of you fade out along the way, maybe my fault. I don't know, but we'll see what we can do in communicating God's message this morning. Before we do that, however, there's two or three things that I, I feel really important to take care of. Number one, on behalf of all of our veterans, I know tomorrow we're celebrating Memorial Day. Uh, Memorial Day goes back a long way. It used to be called Decoration Day. And for us that may have forgotten, or for younger ones that may not have remembered if we've learned in school, that has to deal with the fact of our giving tribute to the men and women who passed away, uh, serving our country. And of course, none of those are here today because we're all alive in the present assembly, but we want to honor our men and women that uh, have served in the armed forces. And if you would please stand if you've ever served any time in the armed forces. I know we have some here in the assembly, uh, quite a few. We appreciate you. Everybody, just give a round of I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Have a seat, because we really do. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, we um, sometimes take for granted the liberty that we have. And uh, just step outside this country and spend some time in another country that's not near what we have, and especially some places that uh, are a little bit hostile for liberty and freedom. And you come back with a whole new sense of appreciation for our people and especially our military. Part two, regarding mission works, uh, we have a, a, a crew that just got back from Nicaragua a week and a half ago thereabouts, almost two weeks, I guess a week and a half, and uh, we're going to have a presentation tonight about that trip uh, down to Nicaragua, to Granada, and, um, but in addition to that, we also have another crew that are leaving this coming Saturday, and so we want to give a special send-off to those people, and uh, there's another group that's leaving tomorrow, isn't that right, Melvina? Uh, Melvina's one of those, I'm going to read the names of these people we're talking about. The LST group, uh, headed out May 27th tomorrow, uh, includes Stephanie Adams, uh, Brenna Berry, Melvina Brown, Sierra McCall, and Trevor Reich. Is that the way you say it, Reich? He says it's like relish without the L, so that's the way I spell it. So. Anyway, um, would you all stand? And then those headed from Central, Melvina, please. Got mail with me here. She's the only one in the group here today. Then from Central, uh, we have uh, leaving this coming Saturday for one week trip. The, the uh, trip going to Peru is going to be six weeks of LST training. Uh, that is, they'll be teaching the Bible in English down there. Uh, Central, though, has a group going Saturday. Uh, the Allison's clan, stand please. Shirley Baker, Bethany Nate Bowen, uh, the Wheelers, and uh, Eddie, that, you know that's you too, and the Sean Hoffs. Uh, for those that are visiting, uh, this is a, a sending congregation that believes in mission work. And one of the things that we tell these people when we send them out is, we stand with you and our prayers are with you. So with the rest of the congregation, please stand. We not only appreciate what you're doing, we want you to know we're behind you in our prayers and our love. And so would you bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, we're truly grateful for this entire congregation that goes and sends to so many places, that gives in so many ways at home and abroad. We ask your blessings on each person that's headed out tomorrow or next Saturday, and that you'll take care of them and keep them healthy. And may their work be fruitful. And may their efforts be conscientious and they shine like Jesus in every way. Thank you, Lord, for your son who made that possible. In his name we pray. Amen. One more thing that Arch mentioned in his prayer, and so I just want to highlight to you uh, the work in India. Uh, we support a work in Pettipudi, India, with a fellow named Suri. Suri Rao is his full name. I could part of his full name. I couldn't begin to spit that whole thing out. Um, but we just got an email recently, and Chris passed it on, that the temperature there is averaging around 117 to 120 degrees or so daily. Uh, we thought it was hot in Nicaragua when it was getting up to 100, and we couldn't get out of the 
the temperature <laughs> to air conditioning, but there's a lot of people that are dying in that state where Surrey's at. And please remember Surrey, his family, the church, uh, in your prayers, and all those people in that area. And um, may Surrey be able to use this to God's glory in reaching out to other people. So uh, let's bow for one more prayer for that. Father, again, we come to you mindful of people that really are struggling this very moment and the heat that they're dealing with. And as Arch has mentioned in his prayer to you, may we ask you to send cool breezes their way and a nicer climate. We pray for Surrey and his family, for his health, and for him to use this in reaching out to others. Thank you for being a God that hears. And we pray all this through your son Jesus. Amen. Do you feel like you have a victorious Christian life? Now that's a, a far-reaching question. But I want you to ask yourself. And then as I pondered that myself, I, I thought, well, basically the response is if you were to respond, which I'm not asking, but in your, in your mind, they're going to vary. Maybe basically two categories. Some will say, yes, I really do. And some of those might not really have a clue what it's about. And others may be a little bit doubtful, but might be a lot closer to being victorious. But in their doubts... They have been through a lot, dealt with a lot of issues, and are scared of what might come up in the future because it's not over. And that's exactly, I think, where Joshua finds himself as he's toward the end of his life and he's talking to his people in Joshua chapter 22. And I want to invite you to open to that. We're going to start to, in verse 1 and talk about what's going on here. And then get down to verse 5, the meat of what we want to deal with in this lesson. But Joshua, if you'll remember as you're turning to that section, Joshua 22. Remember, he's the guy, one of the two spies, along with a friend named Caleb. These other ten that went out, along with these two, into an area that they felt like they could conquer. And they came back with a message for God's people. The spies said, let's go, we can conquer. It's a rich land, or it's full of giants. It's uh, high city walls, but we can do this. And the others, besides Caleb, but the others discouraged God's people. And so they didn't go. God said you can go, and they wouldn't go. They didn't trust God. And as a result, God allowed them to wander, W-A-N-D-E-R, wandering around for 40 years in the desert. <coughs> pondering the 40 days that the spies were out checking out this land. Also in the interval of that time, God was one by one peeling off all of those people that totally never trusted Him, even after He led them out of Egypt. And He let them all pass away. And He brought a whole new crew of people into existence. These younger ones that came up, that had been fed daily, watered daily out in the desert, taken care of, clothes never worn out. And God made this thing devise so that they would realize they should trust Him. Now Joshua took that crew into the promised land and went over and basically did what God said to do and destroy all of these nations. And so one by one he's taking on city after city after city, conquering as God said. Now you get to the end of Joshua's life, and boy, that's a rich, full life because he was an older fellow by the time he took charge of going into the land. But now you get to his time, and, and it's time to reward all of these nations, uh, rather tribes of God's people, for being victorious. So verse 1 says, Now Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now that's three groups that asked for a piece of land on the other side of the Jordan before they crossed. And he said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. So they went in, they conquered, they did what was supposed to be done. And by the way, just to call to memory, there were a lot of places that they shouldn't have won. 
But they knew God was on their side, and so they went out and did it anyhow, and they were victorious. Verse 3, it says, and you have not left your brethren these many days. So the other tribes that went off across the Jordan, they went with them. They helped them win all of that. But you have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren. As he promised them, now therefore return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. Because some of them wanted that side. But they went across the Jordan, they went with their brethren, and they conquered all that. And now they get to go back. How neat. But, you see, they were victorious, and yet they were still living. And if you've ever fought in battles, after it's over with, you realize there's still more to be fought. Just because you won those battles doesn't mean that other things might not happen. And how are we going to continue to be victorious? Well, they did good. Joshua knew that. The war was over in one sense. They're being rewarded, but they've got an enemy still they have to fight. Because Satan is not going to stop. So what do you say to somebody that says, yeah, I feel victorious, but the fact of the matter is I know what battles are like and I've not always done the best, but I'm still standing and I'm here and what really is scary is what I face in the future. Young people, you know what scares your parents more than anything? Not your behavior, but they grew up doing things that some of your friends do, and they've lost friends in the battle of life. Some of them actually have died, and, and they know what's out there in the world. And it's not you that scares them as much as everything else that's out there that could happen. And this is where God is right now, I think, with his people. It's not that they didn't go out and fight the battles. It's not that, that, that they aren't strong and powerful and, and trustworthy. But the point is, there's still a lot going on out there. And God, as he's sharing what he's about to share here, says, I'm scared for you. And so Joshua, right along being inspired by God, is passing this on to God's people. Because it's not over yet. And so he says here, verse 5, But take careful heed to do the commandment of the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart. And with all your soul. That's a mouthful. I want you to look at the first few words at the beginning of that phrase to that section here. Take careful heed. He's about to preface all these things that they're being doing. He pretty much surmise of living a Christian life. Keeping the commands, walking with God, holding fast. Being victorious. But the fact is, it's a mind game. And you've got to get your mind set. You've got to take careful heed. The biggest struggle that we have as Christians is not really paying attention to what's happening. To really take careful heed to what's about to take place. And so therefore, Satan knows that. And he's already working in his side, in his favor, to work against you, to distract you any way he can. We live in an impulsive society. They walk in and, oh yeah, I'd like a new car. Finance it for me. Why do these advertisements not tell you a lot of times what the prices are, but how much the payments are? Because you look at it and go, oh yeah, I, I can add on a few more things. Because there's so many impulsive people out there in the world. 
that make their decisions on, on just a flippant little choice out there. And you might be that way. And maybe just some of the time. And Satan knows I am that way. And so he gets me primed just for the right time. And then God says on the other side, be careful what's going on. The hard thing is listening to what God says. Isn't it? It's not that we don't know what it says. It's not that we don't know what the preacher's going to talk about every time. At least to some degree. Here's God's commands. God, keep up with me. The hard part is saying no to all those things and not being impulsive. Take, taking heed to what's going on. I really love my grandpa. He raised me. And I just, I followed him everywhere. He'd be out in the shed working on some old tractor or whatever. And he'd take a half step back and he'd be stepping on me because I was right behind me. I just went everywhere with him. And I learned a lot of good things from him. And Grandpa smoked. And the doctor always tells you, you need to quit smoking. Yeah, I know I need to. One day he had a mild heart attack. Nearly 65 years old. He came home, and he said, the doctor said, I'm not going to survive the next heart attack. He took all his tobacco, dumped it in the garbage can, and to my joy, put out packages of chewing gum everywhere he used to put his tobacco. He said he could reach in and stick something in his mouth. And that's what the doctor suggested to help him get over that. They didn't have all that nicoderm and stuff back then. Well, I enjoyed it because I also had the bubble gum I could pull out, too. So it was great time for me, but I watched it. For the first time, he took serious what the doctor was saying. I had been telling him the same thing all along. You need to quit smoking. But that didn't really matter to him until it was life and death. Now it's a whole new story. And he quit. Cold turkey, no help, except good old juicy fruit and Wrigley spearmint gum. And I probably encourage him along with getting to buy a little bit more for you never know. Are you listening? B.E. Howard, a real pioneer in radio preaching, years ago, for 46 years would come on every day in his radio broadcast. And at the end of his lesson, and at the beginning of the lesson, best I can recall, he would say, are you listening? That's all that God's saying here. I, I want you to really give me your attention. Don't be like a lot of us out there. I, I know, I already know that. No, I want you to really give me your attention. This is as serious as a heart attack. Take heed to what I'm about to tell you. Because I know what it's like out there. That's what God's saying. He's watched the world. He sees what's happening. And he says, I want you to make sure you take careful heed. And he'd been watching since day one as the world came into existence and God spoke it there. He watched Cain and Abel having their discussion. Good old Genesis chapter 4. And he tried to explain to Cain what was happening. And, and this is kind of what, what went on here. Well, this is what went on in Genesis chapter 4. The Lord looking out and saw that Sacrifices weren't what they should be, and he respected Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. Verses 4 and 5. And then verse 6, it says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Something's changed about you, Cain. Look at yourself, Cain. What's going on? And then he suggests something here. <laughs> if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Wake up, call. Take heed. He can't listen. No. Did God not tell him exactly what he needed to do? Look at yourself. Check you out in the mirror. Something's not right here. You're feeling bad inside because Satan's up to something. 
so much of our problems, our sins, our heartaches, our problems with other people could all be dealt with if we just listen to what God says in dealing with it. We get discouraged, we get down, things aren't going right, and we make a bad choice impulsively out of that, just like King did. Jesus, in several places in the Gospels, say these things, Matthew 24, 4, Take heed that no one deceives you. Mark 4, 24, Take heed what you hear. Mark 8, 15, Take heed, beware of the leaven and the, of the Pharisees and the leaven of the, of the Sadducees. Mark 13, 33, Take heed. Watch and pray. Again in Luke 8, 18, take heed what you hear. Luke eleven thirty five. 35, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. Luke 7, verse 3, take heed to yourself. Luke 21, verse 8, Take heed that you be not deceived again. And then Luke 21, 34. Take heed again to yourselves. So much of the time, Jesus is warning us about ourselves. <coughs> Think about it. Since the beginning of the world, he's been watching how we've operated and how we've lived and what, what's gone wrong in the midst of all the battles. And he said, if you just would take heed and listen to what's going on and what I'm telling you, a lot of this would be overcome. Well, he says, take heed to God's commands and where you walk. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 21. Peter says, we have the prophetic word confirmed 